the problems, just type and let me know. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm in Florida, in America, uh, and it's early in the morning here, about nine o'clock. And I've got a good presentation put together for you. Lots of information. I hope you have a pencil and paper ready. And I'm going to not waste one minute of your time and get into it. So uh, I read a lot of books, about 100 to 120 business books a year. Also listen to quite a few, another 20 or 30. And about a year ago, I was driving uh, to work and I was listening to an audiobook and it, and it said this idea and it was so powerful, I had to pull my car over and think about it. And here's what it is. To be successful in the future, the rate of internal innovation must exceed the rate of external innovation. Uh, in other words, for your business, your company to be successful, you have to out innovate, out create, out strategize, and out execute everyone you compete with in the marketplace, which is a high bar. But to take it even another level, for you personally to be successful as a businessman, uh, you've got to out execute, out strategize, out think, out create, and out innovate everyone every one of your peers on your level that you are competing with. So what I'd like to do today is share with you uh, what I believe are four fundamental things that uh, if you were to look at it on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being world-class, you need to be a solid nine or a 10 at each of these. Uh, so the first thing I wanna say is a lot of people think when I say creativity, that you have to think about what does it take to think outside the box? And what I'm gonna share with you are the things that always have to stay in the box. You wanna be creative and innovative and changing, but there's some things in your business that must never change. Uh, so through all of this, I'm gonna be giving you things that I think should not change. This is a book I wrote. I am not plugging the book at all. Uh, the reason I put it up here is this book is 53,518 words long. Um, and after I finished writing it, I found this really cool software program called Wordle. And what this software program allows you to do is to take the text of a document, load it in with an algorithm, and what it does is it finds the pattern inside of the book. It takes out all the ands and the does and the ands, and it gives you a clear pattern of the main ideas in the book. So I loaded this book in there, my book, and it, it spit out a word cloud. And the bigger the word is in the picture, the more times it showed up in the book to give you that pattern. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, I've got my entire book here on one piece of paper. And then I realized I'm not really that smart. So I reached out to a whole bunch of my colleagues and said, will you send me the texts of your books? Uh, and you see there we've got Jim Collins and Guy Kawasaki, Tim Sanders, Tom Peters, many of the folks that you all have heard from in your webinars. Uh, and I also called my friend Todd Statterson that wrote a book called The 100 Best Business Books of All Time. And all of them sent me their, their texts and I got lots of other information from top CEOs, top companies. I won't bore you with all the details, but I didn't load 53,814 words. I loaded 284,000 pages of the top leaders, top business leaders, top leadership and business thinkers and this is the picture that emerged. This is more than a quarter of a million pages from the smartest business uh, leaders around the globe on what it takes to run, uh, build, and sustain a highly successful organization. Uh, but I looked at this and realized this was still far too complex. And, and as you'll see in the top, top part of your screen, my catchphrase for what I do for a living is making complex things simple. And this is not simple. So I worked on it for several weeks and was able to boil it down to what I call my formula for business excellence. Uh, and this is what it is right here. T plus C plus ECF multiplied by DE equals business excellence. And I'm gonna tell you quickly what it is and then we're gonna go into depth on each one. So the T stands for talent, talent. Uh, for many of you listening today, the future of your business is directly tied to the quality of the people that you can get, grow, and keep on your team and the relationships they create with your customers. 
uh, in, in most businesses today, many businesses, they can copy your product, they can reverse engineer it, someone can make something similar, they can spend more money on on marketing and branding, uh, they you know there's a the location they can put someplace close by, but at the end of the day, one of the only things that is really challenging to copy is the talent that works for you, the great 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 people that work for you, and how well they connect with and get to know your customers. Uh, the next one is C, and that stands for culture, culture, and there's two sides to organizational culture. The first side is what do employees want? Why do they want to work for you? Why do they come back every day? Why, you know, what does it take to get them engaged and excited about doing great work? And then the other side of culture that the balance part is, is how do I create a culture that delivers business results, that hits the numbers, makes the money, allows us to run a highly profitable company? So we want great people that are highly engaged, that deliver um, great business results, and then the ECF stands for extreme customer focus. And I'm very careful about the words I use. Uh, this means that you use customer intimacy, knowing your customers, being close to your, your customers as a major strategic advantage. Uh, and I can tell you that very few companies do this well. This is my 25th year traveling up to 200 days a year all over the world world working with companies from brand new startups to uh, Amazon and Microsoft and IBM and you know all the big big ones too international companies and very very few companies are good at extreme customer focus then last but not least is disciplined execution disciplined execution I'm, I'm just I'm just heading off for a seven week speaking tour across Australia and New Zealand and they've asked me to create some new classes on accountability and disciplined execution. And here's the idea I put at the front of the book. Bad strategy or great strategy that is unexecuted is useless. Great strategy that is not executed is useless. Bad strategy that is executed very well is disastrous. So you've got to have disciplined execution, but you've got to have all these other elements in the front of it to achieve business excellence. So one of the first questions I asked to people all over world, the world, and what I did is I went to all the companies I work for and I sent a survey out and I got to 10,000 high potential employees at top companies around the world. These folks are what I call voluntary employees. They're so good at what they do that if they decided they wanted to leave tomorrow, they would have a job by tomorrow afternoon. They, the competition wants them. They're very talented. They're the people you want to get. So I went to them and I said, why do you work where you work? If you could get a job anywhere, you're so good that anyone would hire you. Why do you come back to the same place every day? Why do you work for the company you work for? And they gave me six factors. First one was fair pay. And fair pay was defined as 10% above or below what they would make to do the same job anyplace else. As long as they could look around the market and say for the work I'm doing, nobody's making a ton more money than I am. I'm being paid fairly, then, then salary pay came off the table as a major motivator. Um, and if you're paying them fair, 10% above or below what they would make to do the same job any place else, and they're focused, focused, focused on money all the time, then you've got someone that works for you who's greedy, and no matter how much money you give them, they're not gonna be happy. So fair pay, that comes off the table. Number two is meaningful work. These folks told me uh, that they need to do meaningful, challenging work. They want to come in every day and use their full brain and be engaged in their work and have fun at making sure they're doing a great job. So meaningful, challenging work. Number three is cool colleagues. Uh, a players only want to play with other A players. So the best of the best want to be on a team with other people that are the best of the best. I want cool colleagues. Next one's pretty straightforward. It's what we just talked about for a second, winning culture. And I'm gonna go into that in a lot more detail here in a minute. But you gotta have a great high engagement culture with high levels of accountability, execution, delivering business numbers. Uh, and the next two are really interesting. And these were the ones that were really the most uh, impressive to me. Next one is opportunity for growth. And this was on two levels, personal and professional growth. Per personal growth. My company is investing in my talent growth. They're sending me to seminars. Uh, I'm getting exposure to bigger projects. 
I've got a mentor. I've got a coach. Uh, there, I'm in the talent development uh, track, but I know my company cares about me because they are investing in my personal growth. The next one was professional growth. And what professional growth said is, I need to be able to look up and see a place for me in this company five to seven years from today, that there's a career path for me and I'm going to continue to move up in the organization. So they wanted to say that I'm smarter at the end of the month than I was at the beginning. My company's investing in my personal growth and I really see myself staying here for another five, seven, 10 years because I've got a lot of opportunity to grow. And then the last one, <clears throat> which was actually the most important, uh, the single greatest reason was I work for a leader I respect and admire. I work for a leader I respect and admire. Let's do the opposite of this. 88% of people that quit a job, don't quit the job, don't quit the hours, don't quit the, the, the pay, don't quit the workload. They quit their immediate supervisor. They quit their leader. Uh, so when you look at what does it take to attract the very best employees on the face of the earth, the top of the top, here are the six things they look for. And you'll notice that massive super high pay is not a requirement. So now let's look at the culture. That was talent. What do we need to do to attract top talent? Culture. Here's a very important idea. The number one factor in increasing the level of highly satisfied and engaged customers in your business is the, the level of highly engaged and satisfied employees. Here's a phrase I teach a lot that I think is really a big, big, big idea. The customer's experience will never exceed the employee's experience. If your employees are not having a good experience working for you, they don't enjoy it, uh, they don't feel respected, they're not challenged, all, all the things we just talked about, it is impossible for them to turn around and take a million American workers, uh, it's also part of an international poll of 8 million international workers. And then another thing called uh, the a Great Places to Work study, which is also a global poll. So what they looked at here was nine major factors in creating the kind of culture that employees want, that employees want. So let's go through that. <clears throat> the first one is fun. And that doesn't mean that we got a rock climbing wall and a sushi chef or, you know, that it just means that people enjoy where they work. And the best way to know this is do your people smile just as much when they come to work as when they leave? Are they excited to get there in the morning? Are they looking forward to doing the day's job? Uh, are they engaged and having fun? Uh, the next one is family. And what this says is we want to create at some level a family atmosphere where we care about each other. We wanna know what's going on in each other's, you know, how's your mom feeling? Did your son win his soccer game? Uh, you know, whatever it might be, but I really care about you as an individual, not just somebody at work or one of my employees. Uh, the next one is I have friends at work, sometimes my best friends. Uh, I don't have to like everybody and be best friends with everybody in the company, but when I come to work, there's a couple people there I really consider good friends, close friends, and a couple of them I might consider my closest friends. Uh, the next one is, am I treated fairly? And this is not pay. Uh, we said pay is 10% above or below. What this is more about is, are the rules fair? Uh, is, am I treated fairly and with respect? And if there's a problem or an issue, will somebody listen to me and help me? Uh, if there's something going wrong, I need to know that I'll be treated fairly and people are on my team to help me. Uh, next one is freedom. <clears throat> what freedom says is I'm giving the tools, training, resources, and support I need to do a great job for my company. Then people get out of my way and let me go do it. No micromanagement. Uh, I'm working with a big, a pretty big company, a $1.5 billion company in America and 500 employees, but the top 30 employees, the CEO basically does all their jobs. He's looking over their shoulders. He's got his hand in everything. He's telling them what to do. He's you know, asking about this. He's making calls to other departments. And I've tried to make it clear to him that the company will never get any bigger because he's at the absolute uh, limit of the amount of jobs he can do. 
You know, 33 jobs is about the most anybody can do. Uh, and he is the bottleneck and he is the ceiling on the company. And he's the one struggling with giving his best people, his senior management team, giving them the freedom to go help grow and build the company. And they could easily be a three to five billion dollar company if he just unleash the power of his best people. Uh, the next one is I take pride in the organization, organization I work for. I'm very proud when I hand out my business card or when I'm at a, a party or an event and people ask me where I work and I tell them I have a great deal of pride in the organization I work for. Uh, the next is praise. And there's been a massive amount of research on this. And here's what it says. The people that work with you to have a winning culture, a positive culture, need to get some sort of genuine, honest, sincere praise once every seven to 10 days. Honest, sincere praise once every seven to 10 days. Now, before you uh, think that I'm crazy uh, and you say, I can't walk around you know, constantly telling everybody they're doing a great job, Yes, you have to be a great leader and you have to recognize and reward people, very important. But what this talks to you more is what I call creating a culture of catching people doing things right. Uh, in most businesses, if you make a mistake, someone is there to point it out rather quickly. <laughs> they will let you know that you've messed up. Uh, on the other hand, in most companies, if you do something good, not great, just you're doing a good job, nobody says anything. So what I'm saying here is, yes, you're going to hold people accountable. Absolutely, if they make a mistake, they need to be held accountable. But you're also going to create a culture where everybody in your organization is trying to catch everybody else doing something right, praising them, giving them positive reinforcement. Uh, and the reason I think this is so cool, I've been the um, owner or CEO of eight companies, three of them multinational. And I've always tried to create this culture in every business I've run because what this means is as you drive to work in the morning, uh, you're thinking about how can I catch one of my coworkers doing something great and make their day by thanking them or giving praise or reward. So I, I get to go to the office every day excited about making someone else happy. Number two is everyone else that comes to the office is trying to do the same thing. So there's a good chance that if I do something good or great, I'm going to get a lot of positive reinforcement for that. And that's a, that makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm part of the family. I'm having fun. I'm treated fairly, all those sort of things. So genuine, honest, sincere praise once every seven to 10 days. Uh, next two are interesting. The, the seven I just told you for 25 years of this research study, those were the only seven. Fun place to work, family atmosphere, good friends, treated fairly, freedom to do my job, no micromanaging, pride in the organization, meaningful, uh, genuine, sincere praise. Meaning and results have just pumped up in the last four or five years, and it's because of the younger generation that's coming into the workforce, the millennials. Um, it's extremely important to them that they're doing more than just a job, that they're making a difference, that their, their job has meaning and importance above just keeping the company running and making money. So they want some, and the big word now that, that I hear at companies around the world is purpose. You know, I want to come to some place to work for a purpose, not just a job, but a purpose with meaning. And then the very last one is results, are, and actually the word was accomplishment, but it doesn't fit in the little bubble. But what they're saying is, I want to be able to point at something and say, I did that work. That's my work. I accomplished that. I'm not just shuffling papers and doing you know, little odd jobs, that I do something important and I actually take a project, finish the project, and I can see the results of that project. So when you look at the things that employees want in a culture where they would give 110% of their discretionary effort, come to work every day, work hard, have fun, these are the nine main things. Now let's look at the other side of this. Uh, what do you want to build as a company? And this, again, is a global study, 1.3 million interviews, uh, and they call it the basic four plus one, and here it is. Uh, four ma five major things you need to do to have the kind of culture that runs a great organization. Uh, number one is goal setting, and listen very carefully to this. We're going to get to it at the very last, very last slide on accountability. But the very best organizations, the best leaders, the best managers are excellent at setting clear expectations, very clear expectations. And the way you do that is by setting binary goals. 
It's a one, zero, black, white, yes, no, no guessing. Uh, let me share with you probably my very favorite business saying. And here it is. Ambiguity breeds mediocrity. Ambiguity breeds mediocrity. Really, really big idea. And the best companies around the world are excellent at setting clear, specific, measurable binary goals. Uh, number two is you need to have high trust across the organization. And I'm going to, in another slide, I'm going to share with you how to do that. But I've got to have trusting relationships with people all around the company and know that they have my best interests at heart, that they're going to tell the truth, that they're reliable, they have integrity. We'll go into that in more detail. Trust. Communications. Here's the key idea around communications. Lots of it. Uh, communicate as much as you possibly can. Uh, transparency is the key here. Uh, I have never worked in an organization in my entire career that didn't say they had some sort of problems with communication. So uh, I, I had a CEO ask me once, you know, when do you know you've talked enough about the strategy and the goals and the plans and the vision and the values of the company? And I said, when you get to the point that if you say it one more time, you're going to get sick to your stomach, the lowest person in your organization just heard it for the very first time. Uh, there, there is no such thing as too much communications. Um, the next thing is accountability. And accountability is really on three levels. Level one is your people take personal accountability. If I say I'm going to do something, I get it done, period. If I say that's going to be on your desk at 4 p.m. on Thursday, it is on your desk at 3 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, level two, then, is mutual accountability. And this is where everybody on the team holds each other accountable for delivering great work. Uh, and the only way that you can have mutual accountability is if you have clear binary goals. Uh, if you've got ambiguous goals, it, here's what it sounds like. I don't think you did a good job on that project. I don't feel like you uh, really delivered super work. Um, I don't think that's when we agreed that you were supposed to get that done. If you've got binary goals, there's no think, no feel, no emotion, no politics, no personality. It's you either did it or you didn't. I like you very much. We've worked together for years. I have great respect for you. But you said you were going to have that on my desk at Thursday at 4 p.m. It's now Friday at noon and I don't have it. I'm not being and in that play in that scenario I gave you. I'm not being aggressive. I'm not being rude. I'm not being ruthless. I'm being rigorous and holding people accountable to the clear binary goals, the clear expectations we set together. And then the highest level of accountability that you see in high performance teams is, and I, I hate this word, I'm gonna have to come up with another one, uh, what I call reciprocal accountability, which means as an individual, you not only expect, but you demand that everybody else hold you accountable. And I see a lot of leaders of organizations that love to hold everybody else accountable, but don't like it so much when their people hold them accountable. And in the highest level organizations, the leadership team, the senior leaders are, are serious about telling their people to hold them accountable if they do not do what they said they would do. Uh, unfortunately, rare to see that. And what they did with this study is they boiled it all down to the three big ideas at the bottom of the page. Wow, man, I want to wow my customers internally and externally. And this is mostly all about internal. Oh, I forgot the middle one. Sorry. Recognition. I mentioned, I've mentioned it a couple times. I've been doing this for two decades. Even I didn't realize how important it is to take the time to recognize people. Uh, and, uh, and there's more and more research coming out on this that if you're going to get, if you give people fair pay, but a lot of recognition for truly well done work, that will make them as happy, sometimes more happy than their pay. Uh, so got to give that, that's that creating a culture of catching people doing things right and making sure that you have recognition programs, employee of the month, uh, you know, a, a gift card, something like that, to let people know that you truly appreciate their work. Which brings us down to the three ones. Wow your customers internally and externally. No surprises, share information, be transparent, and then cheer, which is take the time to cheer your people, to recognize them and appreciate them. Big, big ideas on that page. Let's move forward. This is something that I created. Uh, I call it the four C's of trust the four C's of trust, and here's what it means. 
to build trust in your organization, you must consistently communicate that you are competent and you care. I'm, I'm going a little slower, so I know that some of you are taking notes. Consistently communicate that you are competent and you care. So let's look at the uh, matrix here. In the lower right-hand corner, I have someone who's really competent, incredibly competent, very bright, but they're rude, they're nasty, they're condescending, they're aggressive. For that sort of person, as a leader, I respect them, but I don't trust them. I respect their intelligence, I respect their experience, I respect their, their IQ. I mean, they're a really impressive person, but I know they don't care about me at all. So I respect them, but I don't trust them because I know that they, they don't worry about uh, me or my outcomes at all. In the lower left-hand corner, we have someone that's low competence and low concern. I'm incompetent and I don't care. Uh, this is distrust and you don't want anybody like this on your team. Uh, they're the ones that you, you identify and, and get off the team because no one's gonna trust them. Here's what I see in a lot of organizations around the world, the next one, the upper left, which is high concern but low competence. High concern but low competence. I really like my people, I'm friendly, we get along great, I'm really nice, I'm super friendly but I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm incompetent. And when you get people like that, the hard part there is um, you have to do their work for them. You've got to go around getting there. Oh, he's so sweet. He's so kind. They're great. I love him. I've known him for 30 years, but he never gets his work done. Everybody else has to do their work, not who you want on your team either. I like them, but I don't trust them because they don't know what they're doing. So the highest one is high competence, high concern. Consistently communicate that you're competent, you care. High competence, high concern, that builds trust. And I wrote a, a, a book on leadership. I'm gonna boil the whole book down now to, to one phrase. I'm good at what I do and I do it because I care about you. For leaders that people will willingly follow, that they want to come in and work hard for, that they trust and respect and admire, this is the idea. I'm really good at what I do. I'm getting better every day. I'm studying. I'm learning. I'm going to classes. I'm on webinars, seminars. I'm constantly trying to increase my competence, and I'm doing it all to help you as an employee to serve you so that you can serve our customers and make us very successful. I uh, had lunch yesterday with a friend of mine that's a CEO of a fairly large company, and he asked me, you know, I, I get, he said, I get this all the time, a customer first, employee first, shareholder first, you know, profit, what is it? And I said, in my opinion, it's pretty clear, it's employee first. Because if I hire great people, I create a great culture and I take really good care of them, they will turn around and take great care of my customers who will turn around and take great care of my company by giving me lots of their money. <laughs> so, you know, employees, want to know that you care about them, you're, you want them to be successful, you want them to enjoy their job and their work. Big idea here, I'm good at what I do, and I do it because I care about you. Now we're gonna move to the last two, extreme customer focus, and I've got a couple of big ideas to share with you here. Uh, the first one is easy to say, but hard to do. Um, and here's the phrase, whoever owns the voice of the customer, VOC, whoever owns the voice of the customer owns the marketplace. Who's ever the closest to the customer understands their needs, their wants, their wishes, their desires, their fears. Whoever understands the customer the best and how to serve them the best has a huge market advantage, a big strategic advantage. And I mentioned this earlier, about 90 to 95% of companies I work with do not do anywhere close enough of a good job of truly listening to their customers and understanding them. Now is one of my very favorite uh, ideas. And, and for those of you that are still with us, this is gonna be worth the time, energy, and effort to be on the, this webinar. This is an idea that I learned from um, a gentleman named Jan Carlson, who was the CEO of Scandinavian Airway many years ago. And uh, the airway was in serious trouble, about to go bankrupt. And they brought him in as a turnaround CEO. And he said, we're going to have to rebuild this company from the ground up. We're going to have to start basically from zero. And if we're going to do that, we might as well build the company focused on the very best customers in the marketplace. Why not go after the, 
the customers that everybody else wants and try to steal those away. And in the airplane industry, that's somebody like me, uh, uh, traveling 200 days a year all over the world. Uh, you know, I'm, I get on the plane fast, I get off the plane fast, I know how the deal works. Uh, I, I buy my tickets at the last minute because clients need me places and the tickets are very expensive. Most airlines want lots and lots and lots more customers like me. So what he did is he said, let's look at that target customer, the people we'd love to have, and then look at, let's look at the entire relationship we have them for them, what they call touch points. What's every place we touch that customer? From when they get on the, the, you know, to get on to book a flight, they make a phone call, they get on the internet, they go on the app, whatever it is, to book a flight, to when they get all the way back home with their luggage, hopefully, what are all the places we interact with them? Then, out of all of those, what are the moments of truth? What are the three, four, five things you've got to do flawlessly to turn a regular customer into a customer fanatic, an extremely loyal customer that only wants to do business with you and tells all their friends and family that they should do business with you. So I switch here to an example of restaurants. Um, there, I did the research and on an average trip to a restaurant, there's about 167 touch points, 166 touch points uh, from is there adequate parking? Is, it, is the outside of the building attractive? Uh, do they have nice uh, landscaping? When you get in, is the temperature right? Is the music too loud or too soft? Uh, are the chairs comfortable? Uh, on and on and on. But out of all of those touch points, there are only four moments of truth for pretty much every restaurant in the face of the earth. Only four things they've got to do flawlessly to keep you coming back over and over again. And those four things are great service, high quality food, fair prices for the quality of the service and the food, and super clean, immaculately clean. If I go to a restaurant, I, I wanna know that I'm getting really good food, great service, I'm paying a fair price, and the, and the place is insanely cleaner than my house, insanely clean. So let's say I took all of you out to dinner someplace or lunch. And we went, and I happen to like sushi a lot, so I use sushi as my example. We go in, you know, the place is beautiful. They've got, you know, bushes shaped like koi. Everyone's dressed up in Japanese uh, geisha outfits and everything. It's just amazing. Uh, we sit down. The service is incredible. They're just, you know, they bring us drinks immediately, hot tea, everything we need. Um, we look at the menu. The prices are very reasonable, very reasonable. We're, we're so surprised. The food comes out. It's the best sushi I've ever had in my life. It's amazing. It's incredible. Then you excuse yourself to get up to go to the bathroom. You walk in the bathroom and it looks like nobody's cleaned it in five years. It's disgusting. It smells bad. It's nasty. Now, here's the problem. They've gotten three of the four moments of truth. Great food, great service, reasonable prices. Nailed those. They got all the other touch points, 160 touch points. Nailed all those. They miss one moment of truth and you lose the customer forever. So my question for all of you is, what are the moments of truth in your business? What are the three, four, five, six things? I don't know. It's not more than probably six or seven uh, that you've got to do flawlessly, perfectly every time for your customer to, to make sure that they are so happy. They never argue about price. They're happy to pay any price you willingly ask. Uh, they love the service. They tell everybody about you. They become your marketing partner. That's the idea behind moments of truth. There's two more ideas behind moments of truth. Uh, number one is I'm not a process guy. I really don't like, I don't like checklists and Excel spreadsheets and all that stuff. But I do know this, uh, if there's any place in your business you want process, it's around moments of truth. Uh, whenever you want repeatable success, you want process and you want repeatable success around your moments of truth. Number two is you have moments of truth internally things that your folks have to do for each other, things you have to do for them. And if you don't deliver those internal moments of truth, it is impossible to deliver the external moment of truths, truths to your customers. So you got to understand there's two sides to that. Now we're going to do the last slide. We're almost done. I got about five minutes left before we open it up for Q&A. Uh, and I hope you have lots of questions. I'm eager, if the audio is working perfectly, eager to answer your questions that are outside of everything I've discussed. Now we're gonna to get to disciplined execution. Um, 
if you had asked me 10 years ago what the biggest problem was I saw in companies I worked with, it was lack of a well-communicated vision and strategy for growth. And the keywords there are vision, well-communicated. You know, the senior team had a vision, they had a strategy, they had a plan, but if you went two or three levels down in the organization, they had no idea what it was, how to work towards it, how to align to it, how to contribute to it. So 10 years ago, lack of a well-communicated vision and strategy for growth. Um, six or seven years ago, it was lack of courageous communication. People knew there were issues in the company. There was financial difficulties. There was, they were, they were going to have to lay some people off. They were going to lose customers. Uh, there were problems, but they didn't want to talk about the problems. They want to just hope they went away and hope is not a very good strategy. So it was lack of courageous communication of sitting around a table and saying, we've got some big problems and we have to fix them together. But if you fast forward to today, single biggest problems I see in companies around the world from tiny companies to top of the Fortune 500 is lack of accountability and disciplined execution. There is no shortage of bright, sharp, smart, talented people, great products, huge potential markets, but there is a massive shortage, in my opinion, and from everything I've seen, of people that have high levels of accountability and companies that have excellent disciplined execution. So this is the last major idea I'm gonna share with you before I do a summary. Apple uh, Computers is actually who called me and said, we need you to put together something very simple and elegant on how to create more accountability in a culture. Uh, and this is what I devised, and it's five key steps. Step number one, and, and this is on major projects. This is something that I've got to get this done. I have to have somebody who I can hold accountable for this who will deliver the results. So this isn't on every project. This is on what I call mission critical projects. So I'm going to sit down with a person that I'm going to hold accountable. It's always one person. It's not three people. It's not committee, a team. At the end of the day, there's got to be one person who holds full accountability for delivering the results. I'm going to sit down with that person as the leader. And I'm going to be incredibly clear in my expectations. I'm going to go slowly and carefully and explain everything about what I want, what my intended outcome is, what success looks like, uh, what the timeline is, what the budget is, uh, how much resources I'm giving them, uh, how much decision rights and decision authority. So I've got to get 100% clarity on appropriate authority and resources. I've got this is exactly what I want, I'm exceedingly clear on my expectations, and I've given you metrics, KPI, uh, keep, uh, uh, KPIs, key, oh, yeah, key, key process indicators, key, perform, key performance indicators, forgot about it, I just wrote uh, a book about this and I couldn't remember it. KPIs, metrics, measurements, everything, and I wanna make it clear, specific, and you guys remember the word, binary. I want to give my, my employee as much as I humanly can binary expectations. Number two then, that person has to look back at me and, get, and give me 100% agreement. And I, I personally think the best way to do this is to create um, sort of an, uh, an agreement paper uh, where, or agreement contract where together they write everything out. Here's what I heard, here's what you told me, here's what the due date is, here's what the resources, this is the budget, these are the metrics, these are the KPIs. I believe this is a reasonable goal. I accept 100% accountability. Get that all written down. Both of you read it, look at it, negotiate it, make sure it's okay, it's clean. Then you both sign it. It's not a contract, it's not a legally binding contract. It's an agreement, an accountability agreement that this person clearly understands what they need to do and they have written their name on it so there's no guessing. There's no coming back later go, I didn't understand or I, I didn't think that was fair. No, we talked it all out, boom. An, an accountability agreement written and signed. Number three then is track and post. I wanna take all those KPIs, all those metrics for everybody in the company, for every major project, put them up where everybody else can see them. Full transparency. Everybody in the company, from the top of the company to the lowest person, their key deliverables, their key performance indicators are on 
uh, a whiteboard, a dashboard, a computer dashboard, something where everybody sees how everybody else is doing against their goals. And part two of that is it needs to be really easy to understand. Um, most of the companies I work with use something like green, yellow, red. Green, you're doing great. Yellow, you're in trouble. Red, you're in serious trouble um, on, on achieving the goal. And here's what happens when you do this track and post. 10% of the people that work for you love it. They love to be tracked because they're always green. They're always above goal. 70 or 80% of the people in the middle freak out uh, because they think that tracking equals punishment. So they're scared and they, they, they're they just wiped out. And about 10% of the people in your company fall down on the ground and start crying and it's not me. And that means that they're, they're, they probably don't need to be in your company any longer. You've just figured out the people who are gonna who are gonna mess up. So now we put it up, we track it and post it, and that big group in the middle that's nervous and scared because tracking equals punishment, that's why you go to number four. No, tracking, when, when you go from green to yellow, nobody yells at you, we coach, mentor, train, and support. We run in to help you. Oh, you slipped into yellow, how can we get you back into green? What else do you need? Do you need some resources, training, you need a new software program, you need some help, what do we need to do to get you back in green? And eventually people learn that tracking equals help. Tracking keeps me in green. Uh, and when that happens, they, they actually like the tracking and want more tracking. And then last but not least is you reward success lavishly. And when I say lavishly, that doesn't mean you gotta give them tons of money. It might be employee of the month or it might be a gift card or it might be some sort of an award, but you give positive reinforcement for positive behavior, people hold, commit to a project, they deliver the project on time, on budget, meet expectations, they need to be rewarded for that. And then the other side of it is you punish failure. If somebody is consistently in yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow, red, you're coaching, mentoring, training, supporting, everybody in the company sees you trying to help them, trying to make them better, and they aren't getting out of yellow or red, then there needs to be some ramifications for that poor behavior whether it's demotion or, or you know, most of the time it's removal from the organization. Or as we like to say in America, make them available to industry, or as my friends in Canada say, love them right out the door. But, but you, you help them find another uh, opportunity to pursue. When, when you use these five steps, uh, you will take the level of accountability in your organization to a completely new range. Um, and the hardest part about this for everybody is the track and post, is putting it up in front of everybody and say, letting everybody see how everybody else is doing, cutting down all the trees, no place to hide, everybody's up there. It's hard, but it is the major foundation of this. Which brings me to my uh, summary slide of the things I just went over. Uh, if you ask, you know, well, you did ask me, that's why I'm on the webinar. Uh, the main things I look for as fundamental things to run a bit. You got to have great strategy, you got to have pricing, good financial control, good quality products and services. Those are just, those are a given. But it, when I look at building a solid foundation, I want to hire, grow, and retain the best of the best. I want the best people. I want a high engagement culture where people are excited and they're having fun and they're engaged, but they also know they have to deliver the business results. Uh, I want to get as close as I humanly can to my customer. I want to know my customer better than any of my potential competitors so that they trust me, they respect me, they know that I understand them well and I've got their best interests at heart. Uh, I, I really challenge all of you to take some time and sit down and say, what are the moments of truth in our business? The three, four, five things that make or break our relationship with our customers. Uh, and then let's create some processes and systems and training uh, to make sure that we flawlessly deliver the moment's truth for every customer every time. Um, we got to have super high levels of accountability, and I just gave you the framework for how to do that. And then uh, the, the last two things is that vivid, compelling, and well-communicated vision and strategy for growth, and then pursuing that vision and that strategy with high levels of disciplined execution. Um, I hope that all of you will connect with me there on LinkedIn. Uh, or on my Twitter account, which is awesomely simple. Uh, I put a lot of good stuff up on my blog. Uh, everything's free, 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 free. So hopefully I'll, I'll have some new contacts and uh, friends as a result of doing this together. And now I'm open for uh, some Q&A. And let me know how I should turn the screen back over to you or the audio. I'm listening to you. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. You can just keep the screen as it is. So we'll take the questions from now onwards. Uh, folks, we are open for Q&A, so if you have any questions, you could either put it in the question box or you could equally raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on the console. So if you click on it, uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can have an audio conversation with John as well. So two options: insert in the question box or raise your hand. So let me go straight to the question box. There are a couple of them already posted. First one: What is the biggest issue you see at companies you work with? Uh, well, the biggest by far, and I mentioned a little bit, is the is the accountability and lack of disciplined execution. It's really the execution. Um, I, there are a few places in, in companies where there's more money left on the table than in creating a great strategy, getting it aligned, getting ready, and then nothing happens. And here is my advice. You should spend just as much time in the strategic planning session every year working on strategic execution. And you need to have a system and a process uh, with a cadence of meetings to make sure that the strategy stays in front of everybody and then you've got to instill a culture of very high accountability. Um, I, I teach a class at Wharton uh, every year on strategy and strategic thinking, and I get about 120 senior executives every year. You've got to basically be a, a general manager, senior executive, CEO to get into the class. And every year I ask them the same question. What percentage of companies that have a good strategy, they know how to win in the marketplace, they've got a good strategy, good goals, good plans, what percentage of them effectively executes their plan? And for the last 10, 18 years, the answer has been 10 to 15 percent, and in the last few years, it's dropped to five to 10 percent. Um, other than that, I think, well, the other big place is culture. And I've got a phrase, culture equals cash, and it's the culture of accountability engagement. If you can get those, those are the two biggest issues. Can I get a culture of engagement and accountability that delivers disciplined execution? That's the single biggest set of issues I see in companies around the world. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have another one. How do you see technology impacting business over the next 10 years? Well, I, um, I attended a thing called the Singularity, Uni uh, Singularity University, the Abundance 360, uh, two years ago. They invite 360 thought leaders from around the world to come in. And we talked about eight major technologies that are going to disrupt business, actually the whole world, over the next decade or so. And those were um, deep learning, computer deep learning, what we'd look at with uh, quantum computers, um, artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, Internet of Things, uh, sensors and uh, on everything from clothes to cars to watches. We've got all kinds of stuff now. Augmented reality virtual reality, um, robotics, synthetic medicine, genetic decoding and recoding. I don't think there's a business on the face of the earth that isn't going to be massively impacted by one or all of those, or if you don't think you are, you're probably wrong, but your customers will be. And the, the pace, of, you know, we've always said, oh, the pace of technology change. The pace is getting faster and it's going to continue to get faster. Um, the new levels of computing they're coming out with, uh, let's say the lowest level quantum, quantum computer they have right now is equal to having about a million laptops, a million laptops. And, and within a few years, that's going to be incredibly affordable and we'll be able to do scientific research and data mining and things like that at a level unimaginable even 10 years ago. Autonomous driving, all that stuff. Technology, if you own a company today or run a company, you must be spending 10 to 15 percent of your time looking at technology and how it's going to impact your industry and if it's even going to wipe out your industry. So that's how I look at technology. Thank you very much. We have a question from Badr Ahmed Fraidu. The question is, what are some of the good examples of dealing with a great employee who dropped in performance? If we but under consideration that he is well trained. Yeah, beautiful, wonderful, wonderful question. I think the there's a couple stages to this. I think stage one is to make sure that you're coaching them and spending time with them and, and helping them understand that their performance is no longer where it used to be. I think part of that then is to go back and 
uh, ex go again explicitly about what are your job requirements? What do you need to do? Uh, where does your performance need to be? I use a, um, a tool called the four pieces of paper, and I'm not quite sure how well it'll translate into all the folks listening to companies, but when I ran a company and I had a good employee whose performance had dropped, I didn't want to terminate them. I wanted to get them back, but their, their performance was not acceptable. I would call them in my office and I would hand them four pieces of paper. And I would say on piece of paper number one, I want you to write down what will you do in the next 90 days to clearly show me that your performance is back where it needs to be and show everybody in the company. What are you specifically binary, write it down. What are you gonna do differently? What results will you deliver? What, what are you gonna do in the next 90 days to prove that you should stay in this company? Because if you can't, you won't. So there's a lot on, on the line here. That's piece of paper number one. We talk about it, we discuss it, we negotiate it a little bit. You know, I'm gonna double sales. No, you're not. Our sales growth has been 18% over the last five years. You get me an extra 3%, I'll love you forever. Uh, or, you know, I'll, I'll show up by nine and I won't leave till five. And you go, great, we open at eight and close at six. This doesn't work for me. So we get piece of paper number one. What are you gonna do in the first ni next 90 days? Once we get it where we want it, we both sign it. Again, not a legal contract, we're just doing it. Piece of paper number two is, what do you need from me as your manager or leader to make that happen? I'm asking you to make a major change in your behavior and prove to everybody here that you should stay in the company. It ain't gonna be easy. What do you need from me so that you can accomplish that and deliver all the stuff on piece of paper number one? Again, we discuss it, negotiate it, make sure it's fair, that I can deliver what they ask for. If I can't, then we gotta readjust something. Again, we get it down, we both sign it. Here's what I'm gonna do for you. Piece of paper number three is, if you turn this around, you go from almost leaving the company to being back as a super high performer, in addition to keeping your job, which is pretty cool, what is a small reward I can give you? Because you will have done something amazing. You will have gone, you will have made a 180. You will have gone from being in trouble and not performing to being back to be a top performer. And I wanna say thank you. Uh, and then piece of paper number four is, if you don't deliver everything you promised in the next 90 days, everything we looked at together on piece of paper number one and we signed, if you don't deliver all that, in 90 days, what should happen? And in many companies, uh, many of the companies I've owned, uh, people just self-terminate. They say, I should leave, I should quit, or you gotta fire me. Uh, you'll have to fire me, but I will be leaving the company because I'm not delivering what I'm supposed to. And if a person doesn't say that, then you know that you're gonna start the long and torturous uh, months or years of a, of a lawsuit to remove them from the company. So that's the four pieces of paper. Um, and it's worked very well for me and many of my clients say it's worked well for them. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one last question. As an organization or a line manager, how flexible one should get with millennials to develop a culture of flex hours? Considering more and more millennials work on their own pace, choice of timings and mood patterns. Interesting question. Very interesting question, very hard question. Um, first, well, here's a couple thoughts off the top of my head. First of all, we need to understand, is this a job that has flexibility in it? Is this a job you have to show up for every day? I need you in the office, you've gotta be here. You're the receptionist. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you need to be in groups and stuff. So number one is even in the hiring process, helping people understand that the specific job that you're applying for does not have a flexibility option. It has to be done in the office. Uh, number two is, uh, if that flexibility option is in there, then it's got to be tied to very clear standards of performance and work product. Uh, you know, I can let you run and let you go and give you time off and let you have freedom and go, you know, work at home, but the work has to be world class and everybody else on your team and in your organization has to be world class. Uh, the other thing is looking for different types of flexibility. Maybe they don't, uh, maybe you can't let them go work at home a lot or, or go someplace else, but you can give them some time off to travel or to go to charity or to just have a little bit more flex time for themselves personally where they're not working per se, but they've got, they've got a little bit more time. One of the things we're looking at with millennials uh, and I'm not, I haven't spent much time in your country, so I don't know if it's the same there, but I've just been in um, China uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Amsterdam, New Zealand, 
Australia and Canada in the last just couple of months. And what I see is a shift of millennials of they really, really, really need and want respect and recognition from their leaders. Uh, so it's important to, to give them a pat on the back, uh, you know, a trophy every 10 minutes makes them happy. Um, they value, many of them value travel and experiences over money. So I, the, one of the companies I was just working for was a travel agency and they said, you know, we really can't afford to pay these people, keep giving them, you know, raises. They're already at the top of the level. I said, what about giving them a discount to travel? What about giving them a, you know, if one of your companies gives you six free plane tickets, instead of giving them to customers, give them to some of your top staff as a reward and let them go travel. So look at other ways to give them flexibility. Um, the other big thing uh, to get them engaged and want to work is that idea of purpose. Uh, and then the last thing I'll, I'll say is, I, I do this with Coca-Cola, is they use reverse mentoring. So to try to understand how to give them flexibility, what's important to them, what they want to do, is Coca-Cola assigns brand new millennial hires to work side by side with executives as a mentor, mentee. And it's really reverse mentoring because what they do is they teach the executives about technology. They, they teach the, tech, the executives about what's going on in, society, uh, in culture and in their culture and society, what their friends look at. And I to me, the biggest barrier of understanding how to work with millennials is the lack of, of communication, of just sitting down and getting to understand each other. A lot of people say that millennials are lazy, um, that they only want to work in, you know, in their tennis shoes or whatever. Um, and there's many of them like that. But this is also the most technologically advanced cohort uh, generation ever. Uh, and many of them have excellent work ethic. And many of them really wanted to do important things in business and in, in the world. They want to make a dent in the universe. So talking specifically to them about what, what does flexibility look like for you? How can we negotiate around this? Uh, and I'll end on saying, but it is important. They do have an expectation that I don't have to come to your office every week and sit in a cubicle and work there. I should have, I'm bright, I'm talented, I'm smart. I've been well-educated. My parents have told me, a zillion times that I'm the smartest person in the world and should be CEO of the company in two weeks. Uh, and as part of that, I don't want to work here every day. And that can be a challenging uh, situation, but I, you can get a lot of value out of those folks too. And that's the end of my answer on that one. Well, thank you very much, John. That really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Any quick concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss off? Uh, just focus. I actually, when I was at IBM uh, as a consultant, uh, they asked me to do a, a speech on excellence. And I got down to what I call the three watchwords of excellence, focus, discipline, action. Uh, if you want to be successful in your career and your business, you've got to be incredibly focused on your philosophy of success, on your strategy, on how you want to run your business, on how you want to compete, and focus on that intently. Spend the time, energy, and effort to really understand that well and constantly be learning. So high levels of focus. Uh, the next one is discipline. Once you create strategies, you put it in accountability, you understand your plan, where you wanna go, you've gotta be extremely disciplined in actually following that plan, executing on that plan. And then the last thing is the amount of action you apply determines the amount of results you get. Look